Hi, everyone. Welcome to the presentation of the ninth chapter of the book. This one has to do with acids and bases. The assignment for this one will just be two small things. Well, the participation quiz, because I'll give you a code partway through this presentation. And then there will also be a brief lab. I'm hoping it doesn't take you long to load it if you have a decent internet speed. It should take only about, with the math problems, about 45 minutes or less um, after you've watched the explanations at the end of this, this PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I wanted to show you that there is a handout for this particular chapter, chapter nine, acid-based lecture handout on Moodle. And this one is designed where there's actually quite a bit of places where you can pause the recording and fill in the blanks to help reinforce the ideas. The way that you'll end up having questions based on this, since there's no connect assignment for it, it will be when you see the practice final test, which will be on chapters nine and some uh, chapter 11, which is organic chemistry and some biochemistry material will be on it. And that's where you'll be able to see specific questions from this chapter. I hope that answers any questions you might have about chapter nine and we'll get started with the PowerPoint presentation now. Let's start with an introduction to acids and bases. You need to know that acids contain hydrogen atoms and those acids will dissociate or break apart into ions in water. And the most important thing that an acid breaks apart into is a hydrogen ion. So a famous acid, the one that's in your stomach, hydrochloric acid, when it's put in water, it will dissociate into hydrogen ions, the H plus, and chloride ions, Cl minus. Notice how that anion that forms, the Cl minus, is what's left over after the H plus comes off. You can imagine that the H plus and the Cl minus could once again combine to form the HCl as an acid. The bases will either contain hydroxide, and this is gonna be the OH with a negative charge on the oxygen, or they're going to form hydroxide when they are added to water. So a classic example of a base is sodium hydroxide. And when it's put in water, it breaks apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Those hydroxide ions are what makes the water basic. Some properties of acids. We've got all kinds of your battery acid and lemon juice acid and aspirin is um, salicylic acid. We've got nitric acid, folic acid, and pineapple juice acid, <laughs> so a sulfuric acid. The acids will taste sour and they may burn your skin depending on how strong an acid it is and how concentrated the acid is. They're known to corrode metals. So you start to see maybe some green stuff like on your battery heads in, in your car. It can get quite greenish. Our acids contain that hydrogen atom that is bound into a more electronegative atom. It's often on say an oxygen atom or to one of those halogens in group 7A, to fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, those guys. You put a hydrogen on those and that hydrogen is ready to be stolen away, to fall off as H plus. The formulas for our acids will almost always start with an H. Ammonium, NH4 plus, and here's a new one for you. Hydronium, H3O plus, are also acids. The plus charge kind of gives them away. They, they have an extra hydrogen to lose. Because where do you think that hydronium comes from? We're used to seeing H2O. Well, if the oxygen grabs another hydrogen, he's feeling all fat and sassy and becomes H3O plus. My strong acids in water will completely dissociate. They'll completely break apart into a hydrogen ion, 
and whatever anion remains. So like the Cl minus that would remain. There are five strong acids you're gonna to need to know. I recommend you put them on a sticky note or on an index card, something where you'll be able to refer to it easily throughout this chapter and when you go to take the test. They are hydrochloric acid, told you he was famous, hydrobromic acid. I hear that one's used with construction. Hydroiodic acid, not that I would have any experience at all, but this one is used with making crystal methamphetamine, crystal meth and nitric acid, and finally sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is the acid that's in your car batteries. So here are five strong acids. You're gonna to wanna to know the names for them and the formulas for them. These are the ones that if I put them in water, there's gonna be a single arrow. Remember that from back with our electrolytes in chapter eight, we'll have a single arrow to represent the fact that these guys completely break apart and they don't come back together again. They're too reactive as strong acids. They'll be strong electrolytes because they'll make lots of ions when you put them in water. I want you to assume at your level that any other acids are weak. So we will see a lot more acids, many more acids. And if it's not one of these five that you have on a handy dandy note card to refer to, then you should assume they are weak acids, which of course, as we know from chapter eight, makes them weak electrolytes as well. A little bit will break apart into hydrogen ions and whatever's left over from when the H comes off or uh, the rest of the solution is gonna just be the original molecule. In organic chemistry, there is a group of compounds known as carboxylic acids. And these are weak acids because they're not one of the five we just talked about. And these weak acids are going to only dissociate a little bit in water. So there's only gonna be a few hydrogen ions and then whatever left is left from that carboxylic acid molecule. Acetic acid, classic example of a weak carboxylic acid. Vinegar is typically, typically sold as a solution of 5% volume by volume acetic acid in water. So for every five milliliters of acetic acid, we would put that into 100 total milliliters of solution. So five mils acetic acid, 95 milliliters of water. And that's what you put if you're making like salt and vinegar chips or in your salad dressing, something like that. Let's take a look at what the formula is. You're going to see something like CH3, COOH, or CH3, CO2H. And I need you to recognize this formula. It's not that the oxygens are attached to each other. Instead, what we have is that the carbon here, this last guy before the, the O2H, he's double bonded to one oxygen and he's single bonded to another oxygen. The hydrogen on the oxygen atom is going to be the acidic hydrogen atom. Remember, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So the hydrogen has a strong partial positive charge. He's already practically a hydrogen ion, this guy over here. What remains is, in this case, we call it acetate. It's the anion left over. Everything is exactly the same. The drawing is the same. The formula is the same. The only thing that's gone is the hydrogen. And in its place, we gain a negative sign. So this is now ready to reconnect with the H plus and go back and form more of the original acid. That's why we have a double headed arrow. And in fact, I made the, the arrow longer going back just to show you that it prefers to stay as a molecule. This is what you expect from a weak acid or later we'll see with a weak base. They break apart a little bit into their ions, but they prefer to stay together.
I'm jumping back in time a little bit because I wanted to point out something to you about the formulas for carboxylic acids. When we've spoken about acids before, even just a few moments ago, I was saying how the acid formulas will start with an H. When it comes to carboxylic acids, depending on how we write the formula, sometimes you're going to see the hydrogens at the end of the formula. What you're gonna look for is what I call the COO, the C-O-O-H. I say that um, you know, guys like the girls to coo over their cars and their cars are shaped like boxes. So my carboxylic acids are the ones where we have the COO, the C-O-O-H. And the C-O-O could be combined to say C-O-2-H. But um, that's going to be something for you to recognize as being a carboxylic acid. Our next chapter, chapter 11, we're going to get you better at recognizing carboxylic acids and other types of organic molecules like alcohols, which we've talked about some so far, and ethers and amines and or means uh, all kinds of stuff. Now, let's look at this structure again. I made a, an addition to the formula that for acetic acid, it could be listed as CH3COOH. And then the acetate form where it lost the hydrogen ion, the, the anion that's left over after it loses H plus would be CH3COO minus. So get good at seeing that CO or CO2H at the end of a formula, you're working with a carboxylic acid. And that's a weak acid that will be a weak electrolyte, but is very important in organic chemistry. We do a lot of reactions with, um, with this. And in fact, your body produces this every time you drink ethanol. <laughs> when your liver is, is trying to uh, work on the alcoholic drinks that you may have. It turns the ethanol into an aldehyde and then finally into acetic acid. And that's what your body is able to get rid of. It's very soluble in water and, and out it goes out of your body. But if you drink too much alcohol, then your liver can't handle it and, and you start getting sick because the aldehyde on the way to this compound is poisonous. And so that's when you start having hangovers and blah, blah, blah. So there you go, a little side information for you. Okay. Now, many lipids, fats and oils that contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen come from fatty acids. These fatty acids are the building blocks of some kinds of lipids. And here I've got this image, look at that long, carbon carbon chain with all the hydrogen atoms, two on each, except the guy at the end. And then way down here after this long chain of carbons and hydrogens, then we have our carbon double bonded to an oxygen. So I say C double bond O. That same carbon is single bonded to an oxygen. And then there's our little white hydrogen there, our acidic hydrogen ready to be taken away by a base. What have we got? Well, our fatty acids are carboxylic acids. So the um, COOH, you see that coo at the end, or CO2H, that represents C double bond OOH. And those fatty acids have long hydrocarbon chains, meaning it's just hydrogen and carbon those long hydrocarbon chains of 12 or more carbon atoms and more than twice that number of hydrogens, because as you can see, each carbon has two hydrogens on it, or at least one hydrogen if we make a double bond, they, um, they make up the rest of that fatty acid. The R in this formula here, this RCOOH and RCO2H, you can just think of that as meaning the rest of the molecule. Back in acetic acid, the R group would have been CH3. This is being a little bit more generalized, where my R 
is going to be in this case, I don't even know what, three, six, nine, 12, 15. So this one would be C15H, uh, H31, C15H31, COOH. An example, oh, I yeah, this is the same thing, CH3, so that N guy, 14 more carbons with two hydrogens each, then C double bond O, O, H, and that's palmitic acid. The polar portion is going to be hydrophilic. It's got two oxygen atoms. It can hydrogen bond. It has OH on it, so it likes water. The nonpolar portion, this long hydrocarbon chain, it's hydrophobic. It fears water. It's nonpolar. Water is not interested in it, so it's not going to, to get dissolved by water. In case you're curious, these are some of the uses of some common acids. Acetic acid, as I said, is known as vinegar. If you put it in water, it's good for food preservation and preparation. Acetyl salicylic acid, that's good old aspirin. And if we were in an actual chemistry lab for the semester, I would have had you made acetyl, we would have made aspirin, <laughs> acetyl salicylic acid. Ascorbic acid, that is just a fancy name for vitamin C. It's what makes a lot of our, uh, the juices kind of sour tasting, all those fruits, that's because of ascorbic acid. Carbonic acid, we're going to see in just a little while when we talk about buffers, that's the one that will produce carbon dioxide in our carbonated drinks. Hydrochloric acid, that's the gastric juice in the stomach. So that's, that's the, the acid that's in our stomachs and you can do other stuff with it. Nitric acid is used to make fertilizer. Phosphoric acid is in detergents and fertilizers. My soft drink, the one you guys always see me drinking, um, this guy here, he's got phosphoric acid as the third ingredient. So um, yeah, that's part of why it's really bad for my teeth and yet I keep drinking. And sulfuric acid, that car batteries also helps with fertilizers and does all kinds of stuff. And that one is dangerous. Remember that one's a, another one of those strong acids. If you don't dilute it with a lot of water, it will cause burns. In this case, removing water from your cells. So fun. Properties of bases. The bases are really slippery. They're showing examples here, baking soda, Drano, Mylanta, um, your laundry detergent, your dishwashing detergent, all of these are bases. And so just think about how slippery those guys are. They taste bitter, I don't recommend it. They also corrode metals, so they'll break down the metals and, and start to leave like divots in it and stuff. Strong bases in water completely dissociate or break apart into whatever cation they come with, like you know, a metal ion such as sodium or potassium, could be ammonium, the NH4 plus. And then what else is left over is the hydroxide ion. So our strong bases that we're looking at at this level are going to be things like sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. In fact, the five strong bases I want you to know, look what happens, lithium, he's in group 1A, sodium, he's in group 1A, potassium, he's in group 1A, and then from group 2A, we've got our calcium and our strontium. So these guys can also be strong um, bases. Now, ammonia I wanna introduce you to because he is a classic weak base. He's the most famous weak base we know. And that's because he will form a tiny amount of hydroxide if you put him into water. So he counts as a base, but he only makes a little bit. Mostly the nitrogen and his three hydrogens, they stick together as a complete molecule.
if you're curious, there's some common bases in their uses, aluminum hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, um, magnesium. The magnesium hydroxide, that's the one in laxatives and antacids like Tums. Um, it's called milk of magnesia if you put it in water. Sodium hydroxide, he's, he's pretty famous. And um, that makes soap, oven cleaner. That's also the one you'll see over here, it's called lye, L-Y-E, caustic soda. This is the one that you can use to get rid of dead bodies. It's, it'll completely degrade them down and, and you won't have to worry about getting caught with them in your bathtub. So then ammonia, he, you'll find him in a lot of cleaners like Windex. And it's also very famous for making fertilizers. In fact, okay, I have to do a little aside. There was a member of the Nazis who came up while trying to figure out how to do bombs, in case you've ever wondered why the fertilizers are, are commonly used in homemade bombs. It's um, because it can, it can be explosive. But in the process of figuring out how to make ammonia, which then got used in fertilizer, which then made way more food easily produced, which then kept millions of people from starving, it all came, those positive things came from a really negative original use where this Nazi um, was using it to try to make bombs. So kind of you know, trying to make some <laughs> make lemonade out of lemons, um, which is funny because it's an acid. So there we go. Okay, so now we play the game. This is where you're going to look at your handy dandy index card. It has the five strong acids on it. And then the other one that has the five strong bases. And recall the five strong bases were uh, three of the guys from group 1A, the lithium, sodium, potassium hydroxide. And then we had our calcium and strontium hydroxide. Those guys were the strong bases. I want you to assume that any other base, so anybody else that has hydroxide in them or anything else that you're told is a base, those are all going to be weak bases. So there's lithium hydroxide. Is that going to be a strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base, or neither an acid nor a base? I see the metal, I see the hydroxide, so I know right away he's a base, and then he's one of our five from our strong bases list. HF, formula starts with H. This is hydrofluoric acid. Now, it might be kind of sneaky. You might be like, well, HCR, HBr, HI, all those guys from group 7A, they were strong acids, but fluorine is not. So you may recognize HF as being able to hydrogen bond. And I've talked about him being really dangerous because it, it pulls all the calcium out of our cells and it's a painful way to die. But in terms of his strength as an acid, he's really a weak acid. Cl2, chlorine. Is he a strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base, or neither? Well, there's no hydrogen there, so he can't be an acid. And there's no hydroxide. There's no negative charge, so he's not going to be a base either. This guy's just a neutral molecule, neutral element there. No H, no OH, and even like ammonia can produce hydroxide. This guy's not going to do anything in water. Magnesium hydroxide, so magnesium He's above calcium and strontium. And when you put him with hydroxide, if you look at your solubility trends, you'll see he's listed as insoluble. So this guy's going to be more of a weak base. And that's good because, you know, if you're going to be drinking milk of magnesia, it's, it's nice that you're not consuming a strong base at the time. Of course, that's also diluted, but, but still, you want to be careful with it. Now, here's a sneaky one, CH4. Carbon hates to lose hydrogens. Carbon is not, it's barely more electronegative than hydrogen. So this is not the same as having a hydrogen attached to an oxygen or to a halogen or to a nitrogen. 
this is a hydrogen on a carbon and it's just not coming off, not unless you use extremely strong bases, way stronger even than the hydroxide ones that we're looking at. So this is neither. Carbons hate to lose hydrogen. Do not think of a hydrogen on a carbon as being acidic. It's not happening, not unless you're gonna take organic chemistry later on and, and want me for private tutoring, then we can talk about it, but not at this level. Ammonium, well, he's got an extra hydrogen. That's what's giving the nitrogen a plus one charge. He doesn't mind going back to being neutral, ammonia at NH3. So yeah, this guy's an acid. He's got an H plus that he can lose. It's weak. It's not one of the five from our list. So um, that's, that's somebody to, to keep in mind as being a weak acid. And then lastly, H2SO4. That one's from our list of the five strong acids. This guy's gonna completely break down. Technically, he breaks down into two hydrogen ions because he's H2SO4. And he's a strong acid. All right. Now we're gonna play the same game, only this time we'll take it one step further. You're gonna classify each of these as either a strong or weak electrolyte. And of course, this will be based on whether they are strong or weak as acids or bases. Remember, strong acids and bases completely dissociate into ions. The more ions you have, the stronger the electrolyte. So this time we have sodium hydroxide, super famous strong base. And that makes him a strong electrolyte. Oh, we've seen this formula before, CH3CO2H or CH3COOH or CH3C double bond O and then OH. That hydrogen on an oxygen, he's acidic. This is acetic acid. Now, he's not on our list of strong acids. Acetic acid is a weak acid, which makes it a weak electrolyte. Beryllium hydroxide, the BE is at the top of group two. He's not on our list of strong bases. So his hydroxide ion will, a few of those guys will come off when they're in water. If he's a weak base, he'll only produce a few hydroxide ions and beryllium ions. So that's going to make him a weak electrolyte. H3O plus, that plus sign is another good sign of it being an acid. This is water with an extra hydrogen. And he's fine with losing H plus and just going back to being neutral water. It's still considered a weak acid. It's not on our list of five strong acids. And that makes it a weak electrolyte. Lastly, H2SO4, again, I should have had somebody different this time, maybe HNO3 or something. <clears throat> That's one of our strong acids, which means it's a strong electrolyte. It's gonna make lots of hydrogen ions and sulfate ions. Okay. I bet you've heard about pH before, but I'm not sure that you knew that when you were hearing about a pH value, that really what you were being told was a measurement of how many hydrogen ions there were. Ah, surprise. So here's how this works. Well, the pH of a solution is telling you how many hydrogen ions are in that solution. I'm trying to get this box to go away, out of the way for a second. The pH of a solution depends on how many hydrogen ions it contains. The amount of hydrogen ions can be measured with pH meters. That's what we would have used in class. It can also be measured with chemicals that are known as indicators. There's examples with color changing papers and with dyes. In the lab that you're gonna do, it's going to be um, something that you use a dropper with. It's a, it's a liquid indicator that will change the color of the solution depending on how many hydrogen ions there are in the solution. The pH scale ranges from zero to 14. 
And let's take a look at what we've got. First of all, right in the center at pH seven, we are neutral. We consider it to be neutral. It's not acidic. It's not basic. If you have more hydrogen ions, so let's say you put in hydrochloric acid or you put in acetic acid, uh, the soft drinks, that's carbonic acid. See, vinegar was acetic, gastric was hydrochloric. Tomatoes, that's going to be more your ascorbic acid, the vitamin C. Notice what happens. More hydrogen ions makes a lower pH. The pH drops below seven. And if I'm working with a strong acid, that's going to be way down around pH one or two. If it's something that's less acidic, say milk, um, then we're getting up closer to pH seven. So the more hydrogen ions, the more acidic it is, and the lower the pH. If I have very few hydrogen ions, because there's a base in there, the base has taken the hydrogen ions and made water. So we're missing a lot of hydrogen ions, then my pH rises, it goes above seven. Fewer hydrogen ions makes a higher pH. And we can see, we're gonna talk about our blood soon, its pH is about 7.4, so almost neutral. And huh, that's interesting, they have the milk going across. Um, egg whites, a little bit basic because of the proteins in them. Baking soda, milk of magnesia, there's our ammonia. And then finally, drain cleaner, the lye that I was talking about, the sodium hydroxide, those guys are, are really high up on the pH scale. Because so many of you are going into the medical fields, I thought it was good to take a look at the pH of our body fluids. In our mouths, it's actually slightly basic. The saliva in our mouth, I'm sorry, it ranges from slightly acidic, that's what I meant, it's slightly acidic up to almost neutral. Our blood, pH 7.4, so a tiny bit basic. Stomach acid, very acidic, 1.6 to 1.8. The pancreas, well, you know what the pancreas's job is? His job is to release bicarbonate, which is basic. It's there to help neutralize the stomach contents that are acidic. And then as it moves through the small intestine, we're actually pretty basic at this point, 8.5. And then depending on what's getting reabsorbed, we start getting more towards neutral or even acidic. And then finally, as it leaves our body, depending on what we've been eating lately and, and what's still around, it can be anywhere from acidic up to basic in our urine. Okay. We're gonna watch a video that reviews these basic. It says no pun intended, but if you're looking at the notes, it's the yeah, pun was intended. Of course it was, you know me. So we're gonna look at these basic concepts of acids and bases. And you know, on my recording, it's gonna be not so great. So feel free to, to open the hyperlink that's in the PowerPoint to get to look at these, this video without it being all choppy. I'll be right back with the video. Okay, let's watch this video about acids, bases, and pH. Nice and short video. <laughs> When water dissociates, it breaks apart into an equal number of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. In contrast, when other substances dissociate, they may release more hydrogen ions or more hydroxide ions. For example, hydrochloric acid releases more hydrogen ions as it dissociates, and sodium hydroxide releases more hydroxide ions. Depending on its concentration of hydrogen ions versus hydroxide ions, a substance can be classified as either an acid or a base. The pH scale measures how acidic or how basic a substance is. It ranges from 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. When a substance has a pH of 7, like water does, it releases an equal concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. When a substance has a pH of greater than seven, 
is classified as a base and releases a greater concentration of hydroxide ions. The more hydroxide ions that are released, the more basic the substance is. Bases tend to feel slippery and are often used as household cleaners. Mocha magnesia and ammonia are both common bases. When a substance has a pH of less than 7, it's classified as an acid and releases a greater concentration of hydrogen ions. The more hydrogen ions that are released, the more acidic the substance. Acids tend to taste sour. Lemon juice, stomach acid, and coffee are all examples of acids. Okay. Okay, what's next? Let's talk acid-base reactions. Acids and bases react and form a salt and water. This is known as an acid-base reaction or neutralization reaction. Are you having a bit of a flashback from chapter five, back when we talked about reactions? Well, here it is again. Now, a salt is not just sodium chloride. It's not just the famous table salt. A salt is any ionic compound that is formed from the cation that comes from the base and the anion that comes from the acid. It's kind of like, you know, the ones that got left behind. So the hydrogen, the hydroxide, those guys combine to form water. And then whoever was left in the original compounds, in the original acid and the original base, those guys are just kind of like, do, 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 do. my hydrogen left, my hydroxide left, well, why don't we hang out together? And they make the salt. An example, here we have hydrochloric acid and we're adding it to potassium hydroxide. The strong acid, the strong base, these guys are very reactive. They find each other and they're like, wow, your H plus, my OH minus, let's have them form water. And then the potassium that's left over from the base and the chloride anion that was left over from the acid, they come together and form an ionic compound that we just call a salt. There's my cation, my anion from the acid, and the H from the acid and the OH from the base combined to form water. The acidic hydrogen ion, H+, it's also known as a proton, which, um, well, to tell you the truth, it's because that's all that's left. <laughs> For a little hydrogen atom, he only has a proton and an electron to start with no neutrons in his nucleus. And uh, yeah, if he loses his hydrogen, I'm sorry, he loses his electron, all the hydrogen atom has left is a proton. So that's why we call him a proton. He gets transferred to the hydroxide ion, the OH minus that was in the base. Together, they form neutral water. Ah, oh, how refreshing. My neutral pH seven, this is why those acid base reactions can be called neutralizations. When I take my H pluses and combine them with my OH minuses to make neutral water, well, that acid-base reaction is a neutralization reaction. Here's another one. Potassium hydroxide, strong base. Hydrobromic acid, HBr. What do you think those products are going to be? Well, it's it's a form of double displacement reaction in the sense that the K and the H are going to swap partners. I'm going to end up with KBr, who's gonna be a neutral salt, pH seven, and water, a neutral molecule. So a neutralization reaction. Here's another one. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. He's reacting with calcium hydroxide, a strong base. And together, they're going to make calcium sulfate. My Ca and my SO4 mixed together to form our ionic compound. How many molecules of water are forming in this one? Well, I actually have two H's and two hydroxides. Together, they'll form two molecules of water. Let's talk about amino acids now. We talked about fatty acids 
which are the building blocks of some lipids. Now we have amino acids, which are always the building blocks of proteins. Amino acids contain both a base in the form of NH2 and a carboxylic acid group, COOH or CO2H or C double bond O, OH. And here we have it shown. It's a base on this end. Can you imagine we saw ammonia was a weak base, right? And that was NH3. Well, this is still a nitrogen uh, with a, a lone pair of electrons. And instead of bonding to a hydrogen, he's bonded to a carbon. So pretty similar as NH3. So this is another weak base. The carboxylic acid portion is over here with the COOH, C double bond O, OH. In most environments, so depending on the pH of the surrounding, that basic portion is going to gain H plus. That's his job. Bases go out and they find hydrogen ions to attach to. The acidic portion will do his job. He's going to lose H plus. And so what we find is really trying to find this neutral form of the amino acid, it doesn't exist because it pretty early on the acid loses its hydrogen ion. And then a little later on, the base gains the hydrogen ion. So this is what we say is the neutral form of an amino acid. It's not a pH seven. Um, the neutral form is more around pH eight, depending on what the rest of, of the molecule is. But if this was just say a hydrogen or something. Um, yeah, so it ends up being a neutral form because it has a positive and a negative charge that cancel out. So this is my amino acid that in reality doesn't always stay acidic depending on where it's located. When the con conditions are very acidic or moderately basic, the amino acid can have a positive charge or a negative charge. There are 20 naturally occurring amino acids and I'm posting the charts. I, I found one that I could put it all on one page and make it black and white for you to print out. You're gonna wanna have that handy in case um, I do a little bit in the biochemistry unit with proteins. We'll see if that comes out. But if nothing else, then I'll ask you about which ones are acidic and which ones are basic. Let's look at how to tell if an amino acid is acidic or basic. All of them are gonna have this same general top part to them. What will change is where we saw the letter R in the previous version, that rest of the molecule, that is known as a side chain. And if it's just hydrogen, that's the simplest amino acid, it's known as glycine. If R is an additional nitrogen atom, well, we've seen that nitrogens are basic. If the R group contains an additional carboxylic acid group, COOH group, then it's an acidic amino acid. So even my amino acids can have extra groups on them that make them be in a basic category or an acidic category. So here's our colorful picture. We have glycine over here. What makes all of these nonpolar? Take a look at all the R groups. See how the top part isn't changing for any of them? It's showing my nitrogen um, as NH three, that's a typo. The rest of these are NH3. Oh no, it's not a typo because he's part of a ring. And over here, my C double bond O, O, he's lost his hydrogen. So now he's the, the anion form. And all these R groups are nonpolar. They all are just carbons and hydrogens or what else do we have? The sulfur, it's keeping it a nonpolar enough for this. And I think this nitrogen, for whatever reason, he's ending up down here in the nonpolar group. With a positive charge, we have 
oh, I see what it's doing. This one's going to throw you off a little bit. So it's showing them as positive after they've gained the hydrogen. And these guys are polar, so they're not acidic or basic, but they've got polar groups on them, like oxygens and, and nitrogens. And then over here, it's showing it as a negative charge because it's already lost the hydrogen atoms, but it's got a carboxylic acid group. This one's got a carboxylic acid group to start on it originally. Mostly, I just want you to see that there's these different categories depending on what's in the side chains. And that makes a difference when we start thinking about what kind of proteins are being formed. It depends on which amino acids there are and what order they're attached to each other. And one last concept to go over. Our last concept is buffers. A buffer is a solution whose pH changes very little when a small amount of acid or base is added. And you know what? Let's make this a separate video because the first part's been pretty long. So I'm gonna take a break and we'll start a new recording.